Hi, Nura. Hi, um, Frank. Thanks for taking the time to, to talk to me. Thank you for uh, producing a fabulous series. Thanks. Um, I wanted to start by asking you a question about, in a way, the meaning of Palestine. You, you were born in the US, uh, you're Palestinian. What does, what does Palestine mean to you? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question because Palestine has been taken to such a level of abstraction. It's used so much, you know, if you're in the academic literature, it's used so much as a metaphor and an activism. It's used so much also as a metaphor. And so what is it as, you know, for a Palestinian, I'm first generation um, immigrant in the United States. And so, you know, born only a few years after my family's uh, parents' arrival. Um, my tongue is Arabic, you know, I'm raised in a Palestinian home. It's, 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 it's a place and belonging, you know, without consciousness, without naming it. It's what you take for granted, right? And so for me, Palestinian is my tongue, is, is my relationship with the family, is, you know, a religious practice, if not, you know, as religion, as cultural Muslim, um, it's home. And so, you know, I grew up living either between Palestine in the summers or my cousins with us in the summers uh, very much. This was Palestine for us. It doesn't become a place of struggle for me uh, until much later, until much, much later. I develop actually a feminist consciousness before I develop um, a racial or nationalist or anti-colonialist consciousness. Uh, and it's through that feminist lens that I begin to understand Palestine is a place of struggle and a place where we are struggling for freedom. So say, saying so, so what, what does it mean then um, as a Palestinian to see Palestine? Because I mean, the bottom line is slowly disappearing, right? Uh, I mean, in terms of the land and stuff, you know, we, we've, we've all seen the maps, you know, 48, 67, etc. And you've worked obviously on the, on the Palestine issue for, pretty much all your life. What does it mean to see it disappear in a way? I'm not talking about the Palestinian idea. No, you're talking just about a territorial, yeah. like a territorial shift and a territorial, you know, reality of, of, of um, so here's the thing. It's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because one would assume that there's a moment in time when it does disappear right? Even though the territorial reality shrinks, Palestinians don't. We remain on the land and we remain attached to it. And Palestine remains alive in us. It never really dies. And the thing about thinking even in, in, in terms of settler colonialism, settler colonialism is never a complete project. The indigenous peoples don't vanish and there's never an end time. But there is always, you know, the possibility there is always the possibility of indigenous resurgence, which is what we cultivate all the time and what we cultivate in our homes and our spaces and our diasporic networks. Uh, when, you know, when we speak of Palestine, when we dance Palestine, when we eat Palestine, when we dress Palestine, right? There is never that moment. We don't acknowledge it or recognize that as disappearance, but always as in being. And so thinking about time in an anti-colonial way, it's no longer linear, but much more complicated that it's a colonial reality that's masking uh, an alternative sense of time, which is a time that an indigenous people live in. And that's what Palestine means. So it's hard to say what does it look like for, for Palestine to disappear. We might not have access to the land, but it doesn't mean that Palestine has ever really disappeared. You just talked about the settler colonial project of the um, the Israeli state. Um, this project has been mo moving along in quite a nice, for them anyway, pace over the last, whatever, 60, 70 years. Uh, the, yeah. I mean, there's now talks and more than talks about annexation of the West Bank. Um, but is it something like new for you or actually what does it mean in practice? Like what's the reality on the ground in terms of these annexation sure. talks? So, and, and here I just, for the listeners, just to recognize that there is, you know, different conversations happening. There's conversation about the analytical, you know, analytical reality 
and you know an analysis of what's happening on the ground versus a very personal conversation and it even gets the way that we approach this disciplinarily right if i was looking at this through a settler colonial studies lens it would be very much about the disappearing land looking at through an indigenous studies lens there's a different story to be told about where we are and what we're doing and how we're remaining alive and what indigenous resurgence looks like so just for the audience to know that you and i are going back and forth between those things analytically thinking about um, we're on the precipice of um, outright Israeli annexation. What does that mean? It, for Palestinians who are living on, you know, in this reality, this is, this is predictable. This is the predictable outcome. Um, the deal of the century, annexation, um, the death of, of uh, the viability of a Palestinian state has all been written. And we could have told you this was the case since right? Since the beginning of Israel's settler colonial project. Very much in 1967, it becomes solidifies that makes, you know, all the colonial takings between 19, naturalizes all the colonial takings up through 1948. And from 67 to, you know, the present, there has been a steady course of a project of taking an increasing amount of land with less and less people on that land, right? And so, by you know, by 2020, early 2020, by late 2019, um, the idea that the land has already been taken in de facto annexation. Israel already controls that land. It denies Palestinians access to it. Palestinians do not have access. They have access to less than 1% of all the areas designated as Area C, which is a jurisdictional category that was created by the peace process itself. So for the listener, there's an irony that the peace process has facilitated Israel's impending annexation. For the Palestinians, we've understood that the peace process has been a liberal veneer to continue and expand those colonial takings. So, you know, annexation is about to be a de jure reality, which means that Israel is no longer trying to maintain a facade of um, being in a peace process and trying to establish a two-state solution. It's now very explicit. It's, it's the emperor without his clothes. It's the same that we saw in you know, the moving of the M US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's the same that we saw when Israel declared its sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And yet all these moments of extremity and you know, of panic were met with very lukewarm international response in terms of, of punishment for these transgressions, right? On the ground, what does it change in reality for Palestinians? Not very much, who do not have access to those lands and who have been removed from them and concentrated into increasingly smaller and smaller areas of land, and yet have, have notwithstanding this reality and this you know continuation, have found all sorts of ways to continue to to not only survive, but to thrive, to exist, to, to be very present. And it's that, it's that not only survival, but that thriving and that you know, affirmation, which has been securitized by Israel and deemed a threat, and which has marked us as dangerous. My, my frustration is with sympathetic communities, right? It's not with those who, you know, evangelicals, who are, or, or hawkish Zionists, who see, you know, there should be this Eretz Israel, um, you know, a greater Israel that stretches from the Mediterranean to the Jordan and even beyond, and, or the evangelicals who want to see the return of the Messiah. My greatest frustration is with the liberals, is with the folks who have a consciousness about what Israel is doing and what Palestinians have been enduring who have been part of the problem in promoting, when they say two-state solution or Oslo or the peace process, um, who have been part of promoting that knowing full well that those are the mechanisms that have been used to oppress um, Palestinians, to remove them from their lands and to take their lands, who at all of these junctures are responding with some sort of panic Right. And, and, and that's who I'm frustrated with because they know better. Right. If our job is to tell a community that doesn't know, that's one thing. If our job is to face off with a community who knows but doesn't care, that's one thing. 
but now but to, to be in 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 contest with a community that knows that cares but is nonetheless pursuing this liberal framework and path forward knowing that that is the very framework that is oppressing palestinians that's where my frustration lies it's a similar frustration i have with liberals in the united states who are opposed to racism but practice colorblindness colorblindness is a liberal veneer for ongoing structural racism, right? It is not enough to be colorblind to be against race. You must be an anti-racist. And that means disavowing privilege. That means, call, that means calling it out. That means pointing it out, not where there's just a lack of conflict, but where there is a group that is being disproportionately and disparately impacted as a matter of structure. And so here's where, you know, and, and, and I don't, you know, based on the conversations that I've been a part of, even Israel's impending annexation, much like it's July 2018 nation state law declaring Israel as a place only for where Jews have a right to self-determination, even this has not moved the needle as far as liberals are concerned and how they approach this issue. And it just, you know, it, it basically draws the line and lets us know, at, le at least for those who are in the struggle, lets us know who also is the problem. Yeah, th that's critical, actually. Um, and um, but the question is then, why, if they, if they, if, you know, if they, if they're friendly towards the Palestinian, if they know that what they're advocating is just, you know, impacting in a bad way, the why are they doing it? Why? I think, I, you know, that's a complicated answer. You'd have to, you know, ask people. I'm going to tell you as somebody who has to deal with it, why. Um, privilege is, nobody, nobody lets go of privilege voluntarily. It's a privileged position. It's one that says, I want you to have your rights, but only in a way that doesn't impact me or make me uncomfortable or 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 inconveniences me in any way. It's a position of privilege. That's the nicest way that I can put it. That's the nicest way that I can put it. It's like, you know, another analogy in terms of patriarchy. Men who believe that women should be equal and and, and you know if they're if they're heteronormative, they treat their wives well and I treat my, you know, and I share housework at home, but you're not confronting the structures of patriarchy that result in the subjugation of women in mass. You're not questioning the very unnatural structures where the majority of wealth is concentrated in the hands of men, where the majority of power is can't concentrated in the hands of men, right? And so it's not, you know, you could take it to the individual level and feel very good about yourself, but you're basically, you know, you're basically facilitating a broader structure. And so, you know, I think it comes down to not wanting to be inconvenienced and not wanting to forgo. And, and this is a really difficult conversation, right? It's a difficult conversation to have about anything, about what does it mean to actually be in a fight um, and to do something about it. And the, the question comes down to, you know, are they, and even now liberals who do make the switch you know, many of them, you know, that I've read from J Street to Americans uh, for Peace Now, their concern and their line about annexation is that it's bad for Israel because it makes impossible um, a Palestinian state, which means that a one state solution and the end of a Jewish demographic reality is all but certain. So even then, the concern is still about themselves. It's still, you know, very self-involved. And, so, and that's the night, I mean, I'd love to hear somebody else tell me why, why? If this is not the project that works, why the fear of trying something else that is not, you know, predicated on the, uh, 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 a certain violence, a certain violence of an entire people? I'm going to go back to the, the um, one state solution, whatever you want to call it, point. But I want to ask you, in, 
the Palestinian Authority via Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, in, res in response of these talks of annexation, is declared an end of security cooperation with Israel and the US. But I've, I've followed the question of Palestine for many years now, and it seems to me that he's declared exactly the same thing over and over again without really times, right? doing it, right? So what's, what do you make of the response of the PA and what their response should be? Yeah, this is not, I guess it's not a very uplifting uh, conversation, is it, Frank? <laughs> I've been very critical of the Palestinian official leadership for many, many years. I think, you know, and I'm going to take this back. I think, you know, one way to think about the shift to a two-state solution was a radical shift in Palestinian thinking, which had been since, you know, the establishment of the Palestine, uh, Palestinian Charter um, and its articulation in 1968 as a commitment to a single democratic state. The shift to a two-state solution marked a radical shift in Palestinian national thinking, and one that, even though it wasn't, you know, complete, it was a majority um, of Palestinians that supported this shift, but also saw it as a pathway to freedom, right? Didn't see it as capitulation, but saw it as a pathway to freedom, saw it as a way, you know, they had tried national armed resistance, witness the two largest Arab conventional armies make clear that they would not fight a war of liberation against Israel when Syria and Egypt made that clear in the aftermath of the 1973 war, continued to engage in national liberation armed struggle, um, and then saw the PLO's influence and, 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 and power significantly decline right, through 1988 by a number of junctures, not least of which was the 1982 routing of the PLO from um, Lebanon and Beirut specifically to Tunis, right? So that by 1987, when the Intifada starts and then the opportunity that the United States finally makes available, which is a direct channel to the United States becomes available, it, the, that, that direct channel is conditioned on the Palestinians accepting UN Security Council Resolution 242, which Palestinians had declared as part of, you know, as the as a tool of oppression since its its, its articulation in 1967, right? So when they do accept it, when they do endorse Resolution 242, and more than that, they endorse General Assembly Resolution 181 for partition to partition the land. This is the most radical shift that Palestinians have under um, experienced. Um, and yet, rather than be a pathway to freedom, it's been that pathway that has basically enabled Israel to normalize its relations with Arab states, enabled Israel to um, export so much of its policing power um, and oppressive power to the Palestinian Authority themselves as a subcontractor that is being paid for by an international community that has enabled it to um, stem any legal tools of accountability by framing them as obstacles to the peace process, right? By containing Palestinians within a bilateral process outside of a multilateral, you know, multilateral possibilities, stemming those possibilities. And under that framework has enabled Israel to expand its, its colonial takings exponentially. Why then would Palestinians continue on this path? I might understand it through 2000 because, you know, as the PLO puts it, they entered into the peace process on faith, their language, on faith, which is the worst way to enter a liberation movement, right? I, I get if you want to do that, if you if your relationship with a deity and the divine, but not for a liberation movement. But they did it, took a huge risk. By 2000, all the writing was on the wall. It was clear that uh, Camp David talks had collapsed. It was clear that the United States was not an honest broker. It was clear that Israel was able to expand its settlement project by 100% under a liberal Israeli government, I mean, liberal in the literal sense, it was Ehud Barak's um, government. And then 
Arafat is besieged in, his, in the presidential compound. As far as I'm concerned, that's it. Any faith in the, that the Palestinians had in this project should, was empirically devastated. That was the end of the peace process. So for me, as a Palestinian and as an analyst, Looking at this, there is no excuse from 2001 onward for continuing participation in the peace process. Now, why does the Palestinian leadership continue to do it nonetheless? I think, you know, that's a number of reasons. I'll tell you the most obvious ones. A lack of vision. A lack of vision of what to do next, right? A lack of options of how to continue fighting. I think for the, for this most of the Palestinian official leadership is an old guard. It's not even, you know, new generations of Palestinians who might be able to think creatively about this, but is in fact literally an old guard. And so I think for most of them in their thinking, their critique is not of, is no longer of imperialism, right? Is no longer of US hegemony their crit or of the world system or you know, a, a, which enshrines a racial hierarchy, continues to enshrine a racial hierarchy. Um, their complaint is that they just wanna be a part of it. It's not that they wanna change it or destroy it or, or create it anew, they just wanna be a part of it too. And so I think that that's why they continue you know, to enter into this losing bet where they basically look around and say, well, if the United States as global superpower can't deliver the Palestinian state, nobody else can do it. So we might as well stay here, which is what indicates for us, even when Abbas says this again and again and again, right? They might even turn away as they have from the Trump administration, but they haven't turned away from the United States. They're waiting for somebody else. And it's a lack of vision. Mm -hmm. And it's a lack of new leadership. It's a lack of, you know, thinking about uh, freedom in new ways. It's an attachment to, um, to statehood as the apex of, of freedom, as opposed to thinking about, you know, sovereignty is not in the state. Sovereignty is in the people. So how can we be a sovereign people without the state? And how can that commitment to that vision help us, you know, basically take the risk to create something that doesn't exist. And there's many, many opportunities and they're all full, full of risks. Thanks, it, it brings me to my last question. I guess in terms of the PA, I, I guess it's also about self-preservation, right? Um, the, the PA will just disappear, I guess, without the other paradoxes that you've talked about. But then, so my question, my final question is, if they can't, like if the PA has no political vision, has no idea of, on how to create uh, something else than they've been not creating for many years, like who can? And, and what's, what's the, the step forward? I know it's a, it's a sort of, it's a very odd yeah, question. It's just like three volumes. <laughs> um. Let me, let me start, you know, when you say self-preservation, it's, it's also very complicated, right? Um, part of the self-preservation is the fact that the old guard is a guard that has made tremendous sacrifices for Palestinian national liberation. So not to undermine any of that, right? Um, and there's something existential about, you know, being at this stage in your life when you've sacrificed everything for a particular cause in a particular way to then have to say that we failed or that we tried and it didn't work right short of failure. And we need to, you know, there's something existential about that. And so it's easier to hold on to, to hold on to even a false narrative than it is to admit that. Right. And on the ground, there isn't, a lot of um, protest to the Palestinian official leaderships. And, that, and, and we can also explain that through a number of reasons, right? It's the policing of the population. 40% of the public sector is, you know, 
our, our security forces, right? So much of the Palestinian population on the inside that is beholden to the Palestinian official leadership has become so um, because it's part of an economic system that's been, that's create, you know, generated uh, their dependency. In terms of thinking, you know, the outside of that, what about Palestinians in the refugee camps and creating alternative structures? They're also being policed. The money that used to come in and, and to finance, you know, so many um, alternative governance systems are, is now siphoned off to the Palestinian official leadership. In terms of people like me in a, a, a global diaspora, including in the North America and the United States, there's so much reticence on our part anywhere to say, we can't, we can't say what should happen because we live in, in, in extreme comfort relative to what our Palestinian you know, families um, live under. And so we don't want to, you know, that's why we need a PLO. And so people fall back on, we need to recreate the PLO. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not of that mind anymore. I don't think we need to create a PLO. I don't think we need to create a leadership structure. I think we just need ideas, right? You know, some people believe that you create a structure and then the structure creates the idea. And I think it's the other way around. I think if you have an idea, structures develop around it. And so what are our ideas? And we have plenty, but so many of them are also not shared because again, there's this, I, we've been cornered into a defensive, par, uh, defensive posture that if we forego any inch in our thinking, we could be ceding more territory or we could be ceding you know, any of our rights. And so in this defensive posture that we maintain, it basically becomes a war of position rather than a pathway to creating new, you know, to generating new ideas. And then when, when I talk about this, you know, as I did in Palestine all last summer, as I was there and, and did a number of um, book talks, actually, where I discussed this in the conclusion of the book, you know, one of the things that, that I kept saying is that we just need to give each other space. You know, we just need to give each other space to, you know, to say these things and not to be declared a heretic or a traitor. We need to give our youth space to experiment. When Yasser Arafat took over the PLO on behalf of Fatah in 68, he was 44 years old, right? We're talking about and, and they were considered the extreme and the Arab regimes did not want to see this Palestinian militant wing, you know, take over. And it's the same thing that we saw during the Great Revolt, 1936 to 1939. It was against a, a landed authority in the Arab High Committee. And it was a peasant revolt that displaced their authority. So we have seen, you know, in 36, in 68, now, you know, and even in 87 and thinking about the Intifada, who was leading, you know, the Intifada, and now again in 2020, there is going to be and there must be a painful shift where we have to declare unequivocally that our problem is the PA, but it's not just a matter of getting rid of them. It's a matter of, of creating something in their place, of developing the alternative. There was always an alternative. We have to provide um, that alternative and I think that it exists, but it exists in ways that are, are basically sustaining tremendous uh, global social movements all over the world. Palestine has continued to exist in the international imagination on the diplomatic level because of what, the, what social movements have been doing on a grassroots level, right? All the shifts that we've seen in the United States from you know, splitting the Democratic Party, so that eight out of 10 Democratic nominees don't attend APAC, so that we have members of Congress who support boycott, divestment, and sanctions. When we had a Democratic presidential nominee actually discuss the humanity of Gaza, all of those, I would say, are social movement victories. They have been the victories of these ongoing movements and not on the diplomatic level. And yet so much, not so much, almost all energy, funding, support, attention is given to this diplomatic level, uh, which is sustaining an oppressive status quo and impeding the development and emergence of the alternatives that everybody keeps asking about.
Thanks, Nura. Thanks, uh, thanks a bunch. You're welcome, a bunch.